Yeah. So like Ben just said, he does try to have it both ways a little bit where he's like, I'm a comedian. I don't do real news. But increasingly, once the Obama administration starts, he's starting to sound a lot more like regular news. He's Mm -hmm. lecturing the audience on certain topics. He's not going after the president as much in order to go after finer points of politics and media. And so, like I said, I'm watching this Obama era stuff and it's good, but I'm not laughing out loud, but it is very good, partly because of the technology has improved. It was really fascinating to learn how the show was made because they're such media heads. They watch so much news all the time that they can just recall clips of when someone said something. But there are limits to this. Like every time you think you can maybe remember a clip, you have to send an intern down to get a VHS tape of that day's news and and try to clip it. But by the time the Obama administration is in full swing, they have the technology where they can just search through the closed captioning logs. And so they can find every time someone said the war on Christmas and put that in a supercut of people saying war on Christmas. And so I think the show can get good in this era, partly because technology has advanced. Yeah. And to give you an idea of what bits look like in this third era, the Obama era, this is also the era where most of the stuff is on YouTube instead of Comedy Central's shitty fucking player. So I watched a clip. They recover the day's news. And this was from 2014. It was about Ferguson, Missouri and the killing of Michael Brown. And it was about Fox News's reaction action to a DOJ report because the DOJ, when they came in, found out that, you know, hands up, don't shoot. It didn't go down like that. And that was the mantra for the early BLM in 2014. And the DOJ says, we did our investigation. That's not how it happened. It went down slightly differently. And Fox News has a field day, right? A field day of I told you so over this. But Jon Stewart catches them. They say, "Uh aha, if you would have kept reading the DOJ report, you would have seen that it also said that there were all this structural racism built into political leasing in Ferguson, Missouri. Aha, you have been owned with facts and logic. But the bit keeps going after that. It's not enough to show this level of hypocrisy, because then Jon Stewart says, let's look at something else Fox News covered, like Benghazi. And he looks into Fox News's Benghazi coverage and sees that they were going crazy and doing conspiratorial shit before the DOJ report was in. And when that DOJ report came in, they underreported it. So it's like, this comedy news bit has been on another media company's reaction to two separate federal government reports and accusing them of hypocrisy and inconsistency in how they do the news. We have lost the fucking script, my man. And don't get me wrong, I watched it, I liked it, uh, because it was preaching to the converted. I also think Fox News is bad, but this is not the speaking truth to power into a void that we had in the Bush administration. And I watched not one, not two, but three three different 10 minute segments on Ferguson, Missouri and BLM. And it wasn't about anything structural, anything material. It was barely about any government policies. It was about how Fox News reported on it. This era of Jon Stewart is very almost navel gazy into other media apparatus. (laughs) Yeah, this is the gotcha hypocrisy era of The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is when it I think the, the overall cultural landscape flips and entirely when Obama gets elected. And Obama's election feels vindicating for, I mean, you guys are Canadian, so you guys can stay out of this conversation. But for us in America, (laughs) Obama getting elected was really like, oh my God, that moral arc that's bending somewhere in the universe. I can see it. I can see the bend finally. I can see the curvature of that bend. And I think there was this also undeserved sense of satisfaction that liberals had when Obama got elected. And you can, as like an avid Daily Show watcher for years, be like, I'm a part, I did that by watching The Daily Show. I'm a part of that. (laughs) By giving the Nielsen ratings a bump to The Daily Show, I kind of probably helped Obama get elected (laughs) beyond just voting for the guy. So I think that this is where The Daily Show not only becomes this liberal entity, but has to defend Obama because the media landscape shifts so much as well, where you have these Fox News Mm -hmm. shows that are basically just kind of like The Daily Show, and they become obsessed instead of with the administration, with the coverage itself of the administration just like you're pointing out. Yeah, 100%. And what's very funny is that Jon Stewart does start to pull punches on Obama. Like, how many bits did we have about the drone strike program, right? He's kind of running interference for the administration at this point. And yeah, you're totally right. He has to defend it. And what's funny is I remember in this era, there was like a small news cycle where Jon Stewart went to the White House and met with Obama and they had lunch together. And he didn't say it on the show. Fox News dug it out through the visitor logs. They 
did a little gumshoe reporting of the White House visitor logs and found out that Jon Stewart had been there. And this was Fox News. This was their gotcha moment. I knew you were a liberal. I knew you were a propaganda mouth. And I have the meeting to prove it in the minutes. But when Jon Stewart addressed it on the show, he's like, I didn't say anything to Obama that I haven't said to him when he was in the chair. And he runs a clip of Obama on The Daily Show and them getting into it over something or another. He's like, it was just like that, with, but with the best salmon I've ever had in my life. In that thing, he said that President Obama accused Jon Stewart of making the youth cynical. Like this very tepid criticism that Jon Stewart would occasionally make of Obama. For Obama, with his inflated narcissistic ego, this was too much. He's like, you're, you're making the youth cynical. You don't realize how hard it is to get deals through. Uh, you should be happy that I forced you all to buy insurance after you turned <laughs> Yeah, his complaints about Obama, because I watched all of his Bill O'Reilly appearances, and Bill O'Reilly would be like, admit it, the president is is a failure. (laughs) And I'm like, yes, John, (laughs) admit it that the president is a failure. And John Stewart would be like, "Um, I think his only failure is that he didn't foresee the level of obstruction that the Republicans would offer. His failure was just not being a shrewd enough politician. It's actually the Republicans' fault. And before, it was about communication. I remember he was saying Obama wasn't communicating well enough. Mm -hmm. And so again, it comes to this idea, like you're saying, the debate just wasn't good enough. It's, it's as though we can fix these things through a sincere understanding with each other. And they, they're they still saying this. <laughs> There's still op-eds that are like, can Joe Biden convince Americans that the economy is actually good? And it's like, shut the fuck. This is, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the internet word. This is gaslighting. <laughs> <laughs> I know the economy is fucked because my wage is low and my rent is high and food is expensive. I don't give a shit about the stuff stock market. Don't tell me that the economy is doing great and employment is high. Like I can see it with my eyes. <laughs> and yeah, why wouldn't they run this script? It worked so well for Obama, right? <laughs> Do you remember personally your politics during this era? Did you find yourself, I mean, I found myself defending Obama, looking for reasons to be like, yeah, but, because I mean, I was, you know, mm-hmm. quite, I was in college when he got elected and in New York during his second term. I try to remember what my life was like, what I thought about, what I cared about before Trump got elected. That's when everything changed for me, mm-hmm. too. When he first was elected, I was a big contrarian because I do have a bit of a contrarian streak in me. So I remember in like 2009, 2010 or in Obama mania be like, yeah, this guy actually sucks because <laughs> that's kind of my nature. But I remember by like 2011, 12, I started. Yeah, I, w- I was parroting the John Stewart talking points. I was like, you know, those dang Republicans, their obstructionism, keeping us from having nice things. The stupid Glenn Beck poisoning everyone's mind with conspiracy theories or whatever the fuck. And then I think the thing that really tipped it for me was was like Syria. Li- what happened to Libya eventually and Syria? Those like foreign policy decisions. I was like, oh, you are also a warmonger. Great. We added another two Middle Eastern countries to the tally of countries we broke. You know, another one. Libya. Another one. Syria. Another one. We can put Yemen in there too because that's like American funded even though the Saudis are the ones doing it. Another one. Keep breaking it. I got caught up in Obama mania for sure too. 2008, I was rolling. I read Dreams for mm-hmm. My Father. I remember twice. I was like, hell yeah. It, like you said, it was a vindication. America felt pretty bad about itself. And it was this opportunity to pat a medal on our own back and be like, we did it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I voted racism out of existence. Right. What are you talking about? And we were just <laughs> given by the conservative media landscape these villains to like, not just like to call it parody. I think this is the beginning of the death of parody in a lot of ways. But the Tea Party and Jon Stewart's mission to eradicate them. You know, so instead of examining Obama's policies more clearly, I was caught up in the media dialectical nature going on between like Fox News and really The Daily Show because I didn't watch fucking CNN or nothing like that. Yeah, you're not a boomer. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I just become so disappointed in myself looking back on this. (laughs) Like how, yes, the same way that The Daily Show was great during the 2000s, my politics were too. They were a lot better. (laughs) One thing we also should mention and before we wrap up this era, the Obama era, this is also where we get the rally to restore sanity <sighs> and or fear. In 2010, Jon Stewart hosted a rally on the National Mall. This 
rally was called the rally to restore sanity. And then Stephen Colbert with his even more satirical character was going to do a follow-up rally called the rally to restore fear. And then they eventually combined them into the rally to restore sanity and or fear. And this thing fucking stunk. I remember almost thinking about renting a car and going because I was like 20, <laughs> 21, driving down to DC from Montreal where I was. That's how Stuart pilled I was at the time. And of course I didn't because I was fucking 20. I had no powers of execution for any goal <laughs> longer than a week. But I remember watching it live and the only bit that stuck in my brain to this day is that John Stewart had Ozzy Osbourne playing Crazy Train. And then he had Cat Stevens, aka Yusuf Islam, playing Peace Train. And he told Ozzy Osbourne, don't play that train. I want to get on this train. This is his like vaudeville oh, ass variety God. show style joke that he did. And it closed with a speech about how, you know, we got all this partisan gridlock in Washington. And he showed a clip of either the Holland or Lincoln Tunnel, because he's a good Jersey boy, of the cars zipper merging into the tunnel. And it's like Americans can compromise every day in our cars. Why can't our leaders in Washington do it? And John Stewart was rightly mocked at the time from someone like Bill Maher, whom I usually find just <laughs> fucking so irritating. Bill Maher was like, hey, here's an idea. Next time you bring tens of thousands of people together in Washington for a rally, why not make it about something, right? Rather than like a rally for civilities. Sake. Yeah, like storming the Capitol. Yeah. That's the best thing. <laughs> Man, I, I can't tell you guys how relieved I was when I found out that Bill Maher isn't Jewish. That was yeah. just, that made me so happy. I was like, fuck, finally, yeah. finally, one of them isn't ours. <laughs> Seth Meyers isn't either, which blew my mind. Another guy who's who's putting on matzo face. Yeah, I, I guess the moral of this era is you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Yeah. Which is what happened to Jay Stewart. Exactly. He became just a media personality. But yeah, you, you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And so in the 2000s, he's describing the ideology of the show as taking last night's news, digesting it and presenting you a turd. And now the ideology of the show is to speak truth. This is from the oral history that they're saying about their own show, Stewart had become the nation's fact checker. The showrunner read seven newspapers a day to make sure the info was right. John Stewart has become Jeff Newsroom. And the <laughs> attitude that they have is to keep the administration in check and no longer to present you with a turd. And so you're, you're laughing out loud less, but he's making a lot of really salient points. Mm -hmm. And then one last little bit about the era that I want to mention is in all of the O'Reilly debates and in the Chris Wallace interview, I noticed that John Stewart was obsessed with the idea of presenting news without bias. So that was his gotcha mm. moment on O'Reilly. It's like, you appear on a news channel and you have a point of view that's politically biased. Gotcha. You do the news and you have a political point of view. And Bill O'Reilly would be like, well, you're a shill for the left. And he's like, no, I'm not. I give it to them straight. And uh, I rip on Obama when I need to. A lot of Remember Shuffle is about talking about the culture of the era. And I think that that's one big difference compared to today is for boomers who grew up watching Walter Cronkite when there was only like three channels, so they couldn't really be biased because everybody's watching the same three channels. And the idea that you would have someone who didn't have a political bent was extremely important to them. And they're obsessed with that idea. And I think that people have abandoned that, maybe rightly so. I don't know that I need the news to be unbiased. Like now we have a news system that's so fragmented that I have Chapo, which is the perfect tone mm -hmm. and voice for me personally. And like, I don't want to watch a news source yeah. without a political yeah, leaning no because that sounds boring. Like true objectivity. Unless we're like measuring particles or whatever the fuck not even so, for sure so why bother pretending not even I think there's like uh, the heisenberg whatever you guys are scientists you know as a, as a journalist, I'll tell you, and it's dawned on me while I was working for the New York Times, even the quotes that I choose to pick render the entire story subjective. So mm -hmm. it is disappointing, I think, mm. that, and, and today in particular, is people are not media savvy. They continue to not be media savvy. I don't want to get mm -hmm. into the Israel-Palestine thing, but this might be like a sea change in, in media savviness. I think it might have broken people's brains. And now they're actually starting to understand how the news works a little bit better. Better, but that might be for a whole other subject time. Yeah, yeah. So finally, we'll move on to, I think, what'll be the funnest section of the show, which is talking about the Daily Show since Jon Stewart left. The dog shit era. The dog shit era. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God.